17 and 22 victory uh, 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 loss. Mm. What's frustrating is that again, like the one thing that I can, I don't know if I, I, I do appreciate it that we're we're not getting blown out. No, but it's just frustrating because these are games that we should have won. It doesn't matter how much we lost by. These are games that we should have won. When you when you zoom out from the Purdy situation, and obviously you can integrate Purdy into this conversation here, but what did you see from the 49ers that frustrated you leading to our second loss of the year? They just felt off. Like some yeah. I don't know what it is. Something feels off about this team the last two weeks. And and the thing that kind of concerns me is They've kind of played the same game two consecutive weeks. The offense doesn't really get going. The defense can't quite to make the stops. The only issue with this week is you can't hide behind the, well, the Cleveland Browns are the best defense in the league, and that's why you only score 16. It happens. Mm -hmm. They don't get that excuse against the Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings, without Justin Jefferson, are such, and I mean this nicely. This isn't supposed to be a, a slanderous statement. They're such an average team. That's all they are. And, and Jordan Addison looked like Justin Jefferson. Kirk Cousins looked really good, not to say that he isn't. So so in, in, from that standpoint, like, yeah, it was disappointing to see kind of how off they've looked the last two weeks. I don't know really what it's coming from. I think the easy answer, and we're going to kind of go all over the place here because there's there's a lot of questions. Two weeks ago, we, we didn't have any questions about this team. Yeah, and, totally. and now here we are, and it feels like there's a lot. The Steve Wilkes situation, I, I don't know enough about X's and O's to really tell you what's going on with the 49ers defense. I don't know. I can't tell you. What I do know is in a situation where the offense has no timeouts and really the only thing that can hurt you is a touchdown and it's a third and six, why? Why are you sending a cover zero blitz with 17 seconds left and no timeouts? Because... At worst, like it, it, let's let's say they play normal coverage, and Talano Hufunga's over the top in that situation. It's either a Kirk Cousins doesn't throw that ball, and he takes a little dump down. They they spike it, and depends where it is, they're kicking three. They're they're taking their field goal. Yep. Or B, he forces the ball into double coverage. It's either A intercepted, very good. B incomplete, very good. Or maybe the best case in that scenario, Addison makes a tough catch in double coverage. But the Vikings, the clock's running because the ball's in bounds, no timeouts. They might not even get three points. And so now you're talking about, well, okay, best case, zero points. You can give up three points. You cannot give up seven. I know the easy answer is why can't Charvarius Ward make the interception? And that's a very fair question. But he should never be in that situation. But on the flip side of the Steve Wilkes conversation, 19 and 22 are not insurmountable numbers. The 49ers offense should be able to score 19 points on the Cleveland Browns. The 49ers offense should be able to score 22 points on the Minnesota Vikings. Correct. So I don't want to put all this blame on Steve Wilkes. Like, yes, there are some very questionable calls and things look different. They definitely are different from what we've seen from D'Amico Ryans and Robert Sala. It's just the numbers are still like relatively the same, like maybe a fluctuation here or there. I, I think the biggest concern with this defense at this point, and I'm a very big pressures over sacks guy. I, I, I like to value pressures. I think pressures create turnovers, and turnovers are better than sacks. I know sacks, you can force a fumble. But when you're facing a quarterback who is the second best against the pressure in Kirk Cousins, I think he had like a 98.6 passer rating only behind Baker Mayfield and against pressure. You need to finish some sacks. You can't let him do things like that to you. Right. And what do the Niners do? They pressure him 18 times. That's good. That's a good number. How many sacks did they finish with? Oh, zero. You None. Didn't. And then you look at his numbers and under pressures, he was like 14 for 16 with like 200 yards and a touchdown. And, and now it's becoming a concern that they're not making these sacks. So I think there's a lot of issues with the Niners. The offense hasn't scored the last two weeks. The defense is not working as it should. And that's where this off thing is coming from. Now, the one thing I do want to say, and, and maybe a little bit of a saving grace, and I'll, and I'll flip this question to you, Patrick, is how different does 5-2 and two feel right now if the Niners lose to the Steelers and they lose to the Cowboys compared to 5-2 and two through seven weeks going into week eight with a two-game losing streak against the Cleveland Browns and the Minnesota Vikings. And keep in mind, this is a franchise that the last two years at week eight, we've been talking about a three and seven team or a, whoa, a three and seven, three and 
four team and a two and five team. So keep that in mind. So what five and two feels better? to you? Well, you know, five and two kind of sucks either way. I feel like yes. the reason why this five and two kind of stinks is because there seems to be, I think the reason why this five and two stinks is because we had gotten through the week one yeah. questions of can Kyle Shanahan start a season effectively with his offense? Can the yes. offense kind of click into gear? We were yes. hitting 30 points every single game up until the Browns game. So we had we had an offense that was so efficient in ways that we hadn't really seen in the ways that we'd hoped. And it felt like what could go wrong. And yeah. then it was the perfect cue for all of the mm-hmm. things that we thought might go wrong to go wrong. Exactly. Um, I really think, I, I and again, it kills me to say it, and, you know, Christian McCaffrey, to his credit, he admitted it. I, I said this at the top of the show. That is kind of the moment in the stands, in the stands, that it felt like the game wasn't going to be as dominant mm-hmm. as I hoped it was going to be. Because we were mm-hmm. so close. We were so close to, to starting the game by saying, we run the NFC and you mm-hmm. go through us because we have people like Christian McCaffrey And someone efficient like Brock Purdy and enough weapons, even with Debo on the side, to be able to get this done. And it felt like when that fumble happened, and again, for those who are just tuning in, this is not an indictment on Christian McCaffrey. If anything, this is a a red Sharpie circle around the fact that he is such a good player Mm -hmm. that when something like that, which happens all the time to the best of them, no one is exempt from the fumble in the Hall of Fame. Um. That's a bad omen. Yeah. That's when you know things might not might not be going the way you hoped they would. And it felt like after that moment, it never really felt like the 49ers were themselves for the rest of the game. We had moments where we were clawing back, but it never really felt like we were the dominant alpha team yeah. on a fucking Minnesota tourist visit. It felt like we were in their house after that. Yeah. and And that's what was really frustrating is that I felt like we had the opportunity in that moment early to set the tone. Yep. It fell apart. And then we spent the rest of the game doing our best to play catch up and it was never dominant enough to secure the win. Um, and that's what was frustrating. And as far as the defense, I mean, I top of the show, I also talked about, and if you were in the green room, you can kind of hear it. I talked about someone who I trust, uh, Again, I can tinfoil I had all, all I want. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, but I love it. I, I re- the f- Shane is for real. I've seen Shane deliver information mm-hmm. that no one else did, and then yeah. he ended up being right months ahead of time. So That's right. occasionally he might get one wrong. I don't know, but I'll stand on the table and say this looked like information that I could hang my hat on. So it is what it is. Yeah. I think Steve Wilkes has someone who is a control freak in Kyle Shanahan who wants to make sure, I don't think he's saying I, I regret this hire. Uh-huh. I think he's just saying um, as much as ball protection is important to me for Brock Purdy, mm-hmm. it's as important to me on the defense to not just, let me put it this way. With 16 seconds left, it kind of felt like Steve Wilkes had too many drinks at the casino <laughs> and played a hand he shouldn't have played. Because yeah. he wanted to just see how it was going to turn out. Yeah. And I think this is Kyle saying, don't do that again. Because this car is expensive. And if we hit on the trade deadline, it's going to get even more expensive. So that's all I got to say about it. Any last thoughts on the Vikings before we get on to uh, the Bengals game? No, no. I, guess, I mean, the, God, it just it feels like so long ago. But I think you're absolutely right with the idea that the McCaffrey play, the fumble was really what turned the game around. I, I wasn't in the building, so I can't tell you. I, I, dare I say, I don't think my living room has the same atmosphere. The, the same je ne sais quoi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as but Bank to, me, to me, I think the, the play that really sucked the energy out of the, the – almighty Andrew Pasquini living room was the, was a touchdown at halftime. I think that was the point yeah. where I was like, no, this yeah. game, this game's over. They're not winning it. So yeah, man, I, I think the interesting thing is too, with the report that, that Shanahan talked to Wilkes and then they're having a meeting is, is if you, I don't know if you listen to the play, uh, play callers podcast, the athletic yeah. one they had. So good. Jordan Rodriguez, amazing job. 
I didn't finish it, but the kind of thing I picked up real quick on with, with Shanahan is the way he learned his offense was by learning defenses. And, and that's how he, he totally, he, he, I would say, I, I think he's obviously an offensive mastermind, but I think he understands the, the inner goings of a defense more than people really realize because of that. And, and so like, I, I think he does have some sort of a foot to stand on now, how much it'll change or how much it'll help. We'll see. We'll, we'll definitely see. But I, I think him, him in the media room, I think it was yesterday saying, yeah, that was a mistake to call that, that, that's, that says a lot. That's yeah. I mean, for, for, for any head coach to make a public display of criticism towards mm-hmm. their defensive coordinator, again, I don't think it's the kiss of death, no. but, but it is, it is a wake up call for Steve Wilkes. And I'm really glad you brought up his, res- his uh, respect for understanding defenses because in so many, in so many ways, what makes him so lethal is the fact that Kyle Shanahan is a master of reverse engineering defensive tendencies. He knows that X, Y, Z is going to occur. Therefore, we can prey on those tendencies by hitting A, B, C. And if if we see them go one way, that's why there's so many different avenues for the quarterback to get involved is because they also have as an extension, the authority to make those judgment calls once the the headset goes off and yeah. they're the only ones responsible for making those types of changes. Um, so he's a reverse engineer artist. And if he's looking at the engineering going on inside of his own building and he's, and he has questions, uh, not great. 